Greetings, everybody. Back again to read another short story. Thanks for your comments and your listening and your watching. I'm going to read a story called My Father's Shade. On Saturdays, my father would drive our family into Washington, shuttle us around to the museums, read aloud from historical placards on the corners of buildings, and treat us to lunch at an old munitions factory turned mall. Those moments with him are very clear his strong chin and thick glasses, the wax paper cups of soda, the babble of voices as we toured the expansive halls of the Air and Space Museum, with the spirit of St. Louis hovering in the rafters, or through the Museum of Technology amidst the gleaming, forever stilled 19th century locomotives, the stillness of the art galleries, famous and inscrutable paintings on every wall. The drives home remain clear as well, the highway banked to the right, and I was pressed tightly against the door, window crank, pinching my side. The shoulders of the highway and the thin strips of grass between the guardrail and the dividing fences were always clean and mowed. Often we saw strings of brown penitentiary buses parked on the shoulder and prisoners wearing orange jumpsuits picking up litter. Once, in the midst of heavy traffic, our car slowed as we passed the prisoners. None looked up from their work, but the guard, shotgun propped against his shoulder, smiled and flashed me a two-finger peace sign. For years, I'd imagined that the guard was helping facilitate an elaborate escape. The prisoners were good men unjustly detained by corrupt politicians. This was during Watergate, and every night my father would watch the news of Nixon's fall. It was from the president that I imagined the prisoners escaping, an evil overlord with a jowly, guilty face. What I don't remember so well about these trips are my mother and sister, in the passenger seat and sitting next to me in the station wagon's long, slippery back bench, respectively. In these memories, it is just my father and I. My mother remarried when I was 16. My stepfather, Frank Bees, is a decent, generous man, who has never once said a harsh word to me, even when he retrieved me from jail, where I'd spent the night after being arrested DWI. He came in his company car. I smelled awful. The funk of my binge polluted the confined space. Frank cracked the windows and let me smoke against his own better judgment. His face, normally taut and crisply shaved, hung slack around his eyes and mouth, as if stretched by worry during the night. His stubble was so sturdy that I could hear the rasping of his fingers as he rubbed his chin. My mouth tasted of bile. My eyes throbbed in the morning sunlight. Frank stopped at the 7-Eleven and bought me a Coke and a Hostess fruit pie. We drove the eight miles to the impound lot, and Frank paid the $75 fee and never asked me for repayment. Annie has two young girls that look just like her when she was young. The proof, my mother says, is in the photos. She will sometimes hold snapshots of her granddaughters next to ones of Annie and dare anyone present to divine betwixt the three. My mother loves me, but for her, it has always been about Annie. In Girl Scouts, high school drama club, during Annie's run as class president in college, often my mother will break off a conversation with Annie and turn to me casting an apologetic glance, as if she'd talk to me if only she had more time. She lifts her shoulders almost imperceptibly. What's to be done? Before refocusing on her daughter. I suppose this is only right. I have my father. Today, Annie and her family moved from one side of our large, flat suburb to the other. Outside of college, she's never left this place for any length of time. Her new house is built in an upscale neighborhood called Lakeview. The lake is man-made and brown. The developers say the water will clear as the mud settles and the imported vegetation takes root. The perfect shoreline looks to have been cut with a razor. Bert, Annie's husband, rented a U-Haul. There were eight of us heaving couches and stacking boxes and balancing drawers full of financial paperwork on top of shelving units and plastic storage tubs. Bert wore a cut-off shirt that showed off his gym-built arms. 
My mother and Annie dealt with the window treatments. Frank packed and drove the truck. The parkway between the old house and the new was recently completed and the asphalt deeply black. There were no painted lines, only plastic markers. Tiny rocks rattled against the underside of our cars. We finished near dinner time and Bert ordered pizza. We sat around in our sweaty clothes and Annie passed out beers. She knew, of course, that I wouldn't take one. I haven't had a drink in nearly four years. Bert's never understood why I can't have just one. Tim, how about a beer, he said. Tim doesn't drink, Annie said, protecting her baby brother. Nonsense, Bert said. No one moves without beer. The world's foremost brewer of ales and stouts just died at the age of 87. He drank a pint every day of his life. Just drop it, okay, Annie said. I'm just saying. Don't worry about it, I said. My wife and son moved out during my last bender. After they left, Bert came over with a six-pack to commemorate. It was a nice gesture, but after he left, I kept drinking and woke up in my backyard beneath a bush, covered in scratches, mouth full of dirt. The following week, I had gone to a 30-day rehab. Now I saw Carl on alternate weekends. Jean remarried, but at least she talks to me. There was a long silence afterwards when everyone in the room contemplated Bert's peer pressure. Everyone stared into their pepperoni and waited for a new subject. Frank Bees, as calm a man as there ever was, finished chewing, wiped his mouth, looked out the sliding glass doors, and broke the silence. It's a beautiful view of the lake, he said. You'll be very happy here. I was grateful for Frank shifting the topic off my drinking or not drinking. The room grew a bit dark and hazy as the sun dipped behind a line of tall trees left standing alongside Annie's property. In the ensuing murkiness, while everyone resumed the conversation, I recalled a brief interlude from my childhood in which my father admired the view from a friend's deck. The sun had been mostly set. The edges of the sky were burnt orange, and long streaks of deep blue and purple stretched toward the horizon. Thank God for pollution, my father said. There weren't many people, a few adults with children grown tired after a long day jumping in and out of a pool. My father held a glass of something cold. The ice cubes tinkled softly. The radio was playing Diamond Girl by Seals and Crofts. A lightning bug flickered and hovered near my father's head. He took a sip from his glass and turned to face the insect. They froze that way, bug regarding man, man regarding bug, until the firefly soared away to join its comrades as they illuminated the backyard. Crazy bugs, my father said. There must have been hundreds of them. They bounded off the tops of the long grasses in the field beyond the fence, and as the night grew darker, they blinked more and more frenetically. There, my father and I stood, just the two of us. Here's where my memories confuse me. What happened to the other people? Annie, my mother? They must have remained on the porch or at least nearby. Where did they go? Annie and Bert's lawn is a long green carpet that runs down to the brown water. After everyone but family left, Annie and I stood on the deck and watched the lights from the different yards glimmer on the rippling surface. Across the water, someone had built a dock. It was lined with tiki torches. They were lit and flickering, as if waiting for a group of tribesmen paddling home in bark canoes. I'm sorry about Bert, Annie said. It's not his problem. It's the principle. A handful of stars dotted the edge of the sky. The lights from I-95 glowed above the tree line. The mosquitoes found us. The sound of a newscast drifted from the family room where Bert had successfully hooked up the television. There were no fireflies. Annie took out a pack of cigarettes and a pack of gum. She lit a cigarette and took three quick drags and then handed it to me. She unwrapped the gum and started chewing while I finished smoking the cigarette. Sneak and smokes, she said, just like kids. You didn't smoke then, did you? I said. Your memory's broken. Dad would have killed me if he caught me smoking. What about smoking in that little fort in the woods? 
I have no re recollection of a fort, I said. You gotta be kidding, Annie said. We found that fort. It was nothing but plywood nailed together with a door cut into one sheet. We used to go out there all the time. Annie twisted her mouth and held out her hands, palms up. It was our mother's gesture of incredulity. The gesture I came best to know as I drank my way through my teens and twenties. Standing at my bedroom door, she'd ask me what had happened to my car, or why there were wine bottles all over the lawn, palms out, like she was offering me something, or waiting for something to be offered. To Annie, I gave the same response the gesture always elicited. I'm sorry, I said. All that booze addled your brain. No doubt. Through the kitchen window, we watched my mother unbox dishes and set them carefully in the cabinets. Annie's daughter's chirpy voices came from the bedroom windows above us. Annie chewed her gum hard. Her jaw clicked as she remembered other experiences lost to the catacombs of my memory. Thank you. Part 2 tomorrow.